<laughs> so I have no pretty pictures. <coughs> I'm just going to do this the old-fashioned way. I'm actually going to start out talking for a couple of minutes about um, a graduate concentration in the English department uh, that will, by uh, fall, be a new undergraduate interdisciplinary minor, and that's in literature, social justice, and environment. We call it LSJE. Um, this is an initiative in the English department that centers on issues of race, regionalism, and social justice that we argue has basically been embedded in environmental literatures and writing about nature from the beginning. So most of us, for example, are aware that Henry David Thoreau wrote Walden Pond, but we sometimes forget that he also wrote Civil Disobedience, an essay about his decision to go to jail rather than to pay taxes supporting the Mexican-American War, which he argued was a land grab by southern states attempting to expand slavery into western territories. Um, Edward Abbey's master's thesis at the University of New Mexico, for example, examined the political implications of political violence and laid the groundwork for his later uh, arguments that unregulated destruction of natural resources was a form of eco-terrorism. John Muir not only helped convince Theodore Roosevelt to found the national park system, but he also wrote about the forced removal of Yosemite's Native American habitants in order to turn the valley into our first wilderness park, a park which would then adopt the image of the Indian brave to grace its front entrance and use cutouts shaped like teepees to indicate the sites of campgrounds. More recently, Carolyn Merchant has written on the connections between slavery, agricultural practices, and soil degradation in the American South. So basically, from the practice of locating toxic waste dumps in working class and minority neighborhoods, uh, to the recent discovery that nursing, nursing mothers in Inuit and Eskimo communities have the highest levels of PCB in their breast milk of any group in the world, regional studies, race, and social justice are inextricable from studies of the environment. Um, my own personal research has come out of this attitude towards the connection between these things. I'll talk a little bit today then about literature, water, and public discourse in the arid west, which just happens to fit really nicely with our discussion on water <laughs> earlier. So in 1908, author and Sierra Club founder John Muir raged against the damming of the Tolomne River flowing through the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. Nonetheless, Congress authorized the O'Shaughnessy Dam in 1913 and construction was completed in 1923. In 1987, responding to continuing public outcries, then U.S. Secretary of the Interior Donald Hodel proposed restoring the Hetch Hetchy Valley by draining the reservoir, which provides the city of San Francisco with 85% of its total water needs. In 2004, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger directed a review of the many Hetch Hetchy restoration studies prepared by public agencies during the previous 20 years and determined that the cost of restoration was around $10 billion. In 1963, a little closer to home, Glen Canyon Dam slammed shut on the Colorado River and began filling Lake Powell second largest reservoir in the U.S. after Lake Mead, which is, of course, also on the Colorado. In 2000, the worst drought in a century began draining the lake faster than the Colorado River could fill it. By 2005, Lake Powell had reached its lowest level since Jimi Hendrix played at Woodstock and Neil Armstrong leapt onto the surface of the moon. Backed by the Sierra Club, many began calling for the restoration of Glen Canyon and the draining of Lake Powell. Sales of Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire, a keynote chapter of which is Down the River, a eulogy for, Lake, uh, for Glen Canyon, skyrocketed. 
as did sales of his 1975 eco-sabotage novel, The Monkey Wrench Gang. The central fantasy of that novel is the dynamiting of the Glen Canyon Dam. So these are just two brief examples of the ways in which water policy in the arid west has been shaped and has in turn shaped literary productions. The words of John Muir and Edward Abbey continue to inform debates, debates that will decide the fate of some of the largest and most expensive water management projects in the US. Um, I argue that a deeper understanding of and appreciation for the role of literary texts and other cultural productions in these debates could aid policymakers and the public in crafting successful long-term water management strategies. Literary productions um, also shaped public discourse in the earlier battle that took place at the beginning of the 20th century in California. So in response to the proposal uh, to build O'Shaughnessy Dam in the Hetch Hetchy Valley, John Muir wrote to Congress and to the public at large in a series of very popular essays. And while he failed, in his bid to prevent the dam from being built in the first place, his words are the most often quoted, even today, in public discourse about Hetch Hetchy, especially this little pithy sound bite. Quote, damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of men. So note the rhetoric employed in these passages. There's talk of battles and adversaries, cathedrals, churches, holy sacrifice. These are the terms, for better or for worse, and I, I would argue for worse, that often shape public discourse surrounding water management in the West. The language tends to be violent, polarizing, unilateral, but not just on the side of environmentalists and the literatures they produce. Responding to a study by UC Davis water researchers suggesting that Hetch Hetchy could in fact be restored without significantly impacting water or energy resources downstream, the president of the Bay Area Business Council in San Francisco said in a statement to reporters, quote, these researchers are obviously looking for water in the sand because that's where their heads are. Our organization is not willing to look at any study that involves removing the O'Shaughnessy Dam. California State Senator Jeff Denham was inspired to write an editorial on Hetch Hetchy over his outrage at what the UC Davis researchers had produced. Ignoring the fact that the idea to drain the reservoir was initially proposed in 1987 by conservative Republican and Reagan-appointed Interior Secretary Donald Hodel, Senator Denham declares that, quote, draining Hetch Hetchy is a ploy by the radical left. Radical environmentalists are emulating the short-sightedness that worked so well for labor leaders and trial lawyers who gave us today's workers' compensation crisis. So, as you can see, the rhetoric from both sides tends to be highly inflammatory, but researchers and policymakers may well ask, as was asked <laughs> just a few minutes ago, so what? Uh, do policymakers or lawmakers like Senator Denham really need to pay attention to works of literature produced by non-experts? Can their words actually sway policymakers or the public in any meaningful way? The history of water policy, literature, and public discourse in the arid west suggests that this is in fact the case, that many thousands of people could disagree on both sides of the political spectrum so violently and over such an extended period of time that many, many millions of dollars, private and public, have been spent studying how to reverse the best laid policy decisions of the past. Of course, the legacy of Edward Abbey's books, the formation of the environmental group Earth First, directly inspired by Abbey's novel, The Monkey Wrench Gang, is well known. Um, but right now, I'd like to take a closer look at the Hetch Hetchy debate. The history of this water project suggests that texts can and do shape the attitudes and responses of lawmakers, policy professionals, and the general public with potentially dramatic and extraordinarily expensive results. Let me start again with John Muir, but not in 1908, <coughs> rather in 2004. That is 
with the words of another author, journalist Tom Phillip. In the summer of that year, Tom Phillip began writing a series of editorials for the Sacramento Bee called Hetch Hetchy Reclaimed. In this series of editorials, he cites the work of the UC Davis researchers who wrote a computer program known as CALVIN, which stands for California Value Integrated Network, uh, essentially a water modeling program designed to calculate how changes might affect a water system. Philip interviews the researchers who ran Interior Secretary Hodel's 1987 proposal through Calvin to obtain the results that so upset Senator Denham. He interviews Donald Hodel himself. Uh, he interviews the general manager of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, the general manager of the Bay Area Water Supply, both of whom violently opposed draining Hetch Hetchy. But of all the people quoted, interviewed, or referenced by Tom Phillip in his Pulitzer Prize winning series, only one appears in fully 26 of the 50 editorials. And it's not the governor, utilities commissioners, scientists, or state legislators. It's John Muir, the man for whom more parks, schools, and public places in California are named than any other person, the man whose face adorns the California Quarter, a man who failed to keep the O'Shaughnessy Dam from being built and who's been dead for nearly 100 years. Tom Phillip begins the first editorial in his series by referencing John Muir. Uh, his September 5th installment is an imaginary interview with Muir using quotes from Muir's work to answer questions in the current Hetch Hetchy debate. Phillip closes this particular installment with something rarely seen in a newspaper editorial, a bibliography citing each of the 16 separate quotes from 13 different texts of Muir's writing that went into Phillips' imagined interview, literally bringing Muir's voice into this 21st century debate and reinserting Muir's literary productions into public discourse and the decision-making process. But have the combined ideas and voices of John Muir and Tom Phillips speaking through the pages of an editorial published nearly a century after Muir's death, had any impact on the public debate or policy decisions currently shaping the future of Hetch Hetchy Valley. This remains to be seen as far as final outcomes go, but while Governor Schwarzenegger commissioned a study to examine the possibility of draining the Hetch Hetchy Valley, uh, uh, an undertaking that would likely exceed $10 billion, uh, Bay Area businesses have so far succeeded in blocking attempts to decommission the O'Shaughnessy Dam. However, local environmental groups in August of this year responded by filing a lawsuit currently being considered in federal court that would require the National Park Service, which administers the O'Shaughnessy Dam because it sits in a national park, uh, to consult with federal wildlife agencies before allowing San Francisco to continue taking water from the reservoir um, in accordance with the Endangered Species Act. One of the things they have asked the court to consider is Tom Phillips' editorial series on Hetch Hetchy. An interesting aspect of this debate is the use of John Muir's literary production by environmentalists as part of their attempts to shape public discourse. Significantly, the only players in this drama that seem to consistently decline to mention, quote, or even acknowledge John Muir, uh, are those directly creating policy. This despite the fact that Muir himself, while he opposed building a dam in the Hetch Hetchy Valley, was by no means opposed to all dams everywhere, nor opposed to tourism, lumbering, or mining operations. Uh, and yet, literary texts today appear to be shaping public discourse from only one side. Or put another way, policymakers seem to believe that by ignoring literature themselves, they can prevent those texts from affecting policymaking processes. Thus, at the cost of millions of dollars already spent, we see policymakers building dams and almost simultaneously debating whether or not to decommission them. And my time is up. Thank you all very much. Does anyone have questions for Sarah? Sure. Um, in 1987, right after Don Hallel made that uh, recommendation, 
apparently it came to him like sort of came to him. Um, they uh, had a, a gathering at the dam to, to uh, various interest groups to talk about it. San Francisco was uh, against it, uh, taking down the dam, not only because of the water, and the water is important because San Francisco has some of the best water in the nation. The best. Um, it's delicious, <laughs> but um, it's, all, it's mainly because uh, San Francisco gets the power from the, the which you didn't mention, uh, and, I, and at the time, the power supply, the power plant, and the, the public electricity generated from that <coughs> was more important. And it was, in fact, <coughs> a rider onto the original bill back in 1913 that made the, any power that came to the dam public power. Uh, and it goes straight to San Francisco, and if you ride um, the Muni or the electric buses, I mean, they have this incredible electrified the transportation system, all that electricity comes from O'Shaughnessy Dam. Indeed. Uh, and, and three dams Francisco that have now been built below it. What's that? And the three newer dams that have now been built further downstream. The electricity is, is goes to San Francisco? A and to the the watershed area below it? Because uh, the, the advantage of the O'Shaughnessy electricity was that you know, the taxpayers don't which is a huge advantage and, and right, is one is of the interesting uh, political bedfellows that results from this with, for instance, Senator Dianne Feinstein typically lumped with those radical liberals who definitely opposes decommissioning O'Shaughnessy Dam, while the Republican representatives up in Lake Tahoe who see it as a potential tourist draw should it be decommissioned and drained really would like to see it go. So it's very interesting in California politics because it's pitting San Francisco against uh, other parts of the state who feel that San Francisco is getting a really sweet deal, which of course they are. Yeah, which is why they're against taking it down. Which is why they're against <laughs> decommissioning it, absolutely. Any other questions? Yep, Kim. So you mentioned several of the, the, uh, the books and authors that I remember growing up on. And Edward Abbey was one of my favorites. I remember reading him in college and being very radical at the time. Um, um, does he still have the, uh, the, the reading audience of the young people that are going to be fired up by his, uh, his ideas? Yes, in fact, what I didn't have time to talk about was the Glen Canyon uh, brouhaha, that now that the water has dropped so low, in Glen Canyon, people who hiked the canyon and saw it as children are now going back and for the first time the water's low enough they can see it again. Um, and several years ago the New York Times did an article on it in which they open and close the article with Edward Abbey's quotes from down the river. Um, and as I said, when this uh, controversy and suggestion about uh, decommissioning the Glen Canyon Dam first started getting traction in the media, immediately sales of his book just went through the roof. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> We're always happy when book sales. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah.